You won't find out much about me. I'm not the important one in this tale. I was out walking my dog one day, a beautiful riverside walk. I happened to look at the ground, a million damp oak leaves, abandoned like sailors' canoes. The river ran faster than usual, even the ducks finding it difficult to swim in a straight line. Mindlessly, I knelt down and selected a handful of leaves and threw them into the hungry river, watching them disappear rapidly, just like the antics of an enthralled seven-year-old. A blank Thursday on the calendar. Nothing to do, nowhere to be. A day to myself. I turned around, feeling it an appropriate time to head home, when I chanced upon a rather large and deep hole that had clearly been dug by my dog a few moments earlier. On my knees, right arm fully outstretched, I managed to retrieve a large package that was thoroughly wrapped. The outer layer was silver foil, and it took me a good minute to peel it off. Then there was a thin layer of what felt like cardboard, but I wasn't sure of the material. The next layer comprised of newspaper, and then one more layer of an unknown material. It reminded me of playing past the parcel when I was a child. What remained was a translucent plastic bag which was held together by a dozen jumbo elastic bands. It looked like cash inside, but I couldn't be sure. My first feeling was of indifference, which surprised me. Perhaps it was because I had no need for the money. Inside the plastic bag, I found several bunches of neatly folded fifty-pound notes. My second feeling was disbelief. The whole thing was such a cliché that I wondered if I'd been set up. When I arrived home, I counted the notes. Forty thousand pounds. The outer packaging looked old and I assumed the money had been there for quite some time. I also assumed that it was no longer needed by its owner. I decided not to go to the police because I wanted to think of something more positive and creative to do with the money. I invented an experiment and decided to give £4,000 to ten different people, probably homeless or in other exceptionally difficult situations. I made one condition. They must try to contact me within 18 months and give me a report on how this sum of money might have changed their lives. Of course, I couldn't assume that the money would work positively, even if that is what I hoped. My experiment had several aims. To see if an unexpected windfall could bring joy. To look more deeply into this medium of exchange that so much of life seems to depend upon. To reflect on how money could affect different personality types and anything else that might arise. Nearly two years later and I only had four replies. Dave had been a struggling musician with the classic little bedsit lifestyle, guitar fighting for space and finding a home propped up against the unreliable combi boiler. He told me he just needed a little break, some money to promote his material. He was convinced he was the next Ed Sheeran. The first thing he did was gamble away £2,000. The second thing he did was buy a load of drugs, convinced that they acted as his muse. The remaining money was stolen by one of his friends whilst they were high together. And was it possible that I could lend him a similar sum because he was sure he had matured in the last couple of years, as had his music? Daphne, who lived in the Cotswolds, had set up her own souvenir business, which had failed due to being locked down during the time of the virus. Interestingly, she also asked for some more money because she was now sure of success by trading in bitcoins online. At first, when I heard from Paul, I thought it was going to be a success story. He had invested his 4000 in a lock-up garage in Islington and rented this out long-term, charging £200 per month. Just as he had recouped his money, 
he was looking forward to a profitable future, the police took him away and locked him up, assuming him to be an accomplice in the stolen goods that were being stored at his garage. Maureen was more or less homeless when I met her. She was typing away on an old and battered first-generation iPad. I was intrigued and asked her what she was writing. She read out the most incredible short story, and I knew that she was very talented. She used the money to buy some decent clothes so that she felt comfortable visiting various publishing houses. One large establishment took her on and made a massive profit on her, which they invested in highly unreputable companies. I was sad that I hadn't managed to help anyone, and I wondered if £4,000 was not enough to make a significant difference in a person's life. Or maybe it's the awareness or intelligence of the person that counts. In any case, I decided that I might as well have given the money to the police. What the experiment did teach me, however, was that my own ego could never play a significant part in such an experiment, because the long, long trail of cause and effect is much too complicated for the comprehension of a single human being.' 